Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here for a new talk uh, here at the, at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk, the talk by Dr. Jesús Toala, and he will talk about destroying planetary systems. Dr. Jesús Toala will be properly introduced by uh, Martin Guerrero. Martin, please. Okay, thank you, Rune. Uh, well, everybody knows uh, Jesus Tola here at the IAE, but I'd like to, to provide you all the details about his life and productive career. He got his uh, PhD here in October 2014, and because he ended the, uh, the PhD in advance of the duration of the grant, we still have money to hire him as postdoc here at the IAEA. Then he left on January 2016 and moved to ASEA as a distinguished postdoc fellow there at Taipei and in Taiwan. <clears throat> in June 2017, he moved uh, to Mexico. And from then, he's an uh, investigador associado of the uh, IRIA, one of the UNAM Institute. He has the SNIE level one. Uh, at this position. Uh, he arrived there at, at IREA and he uh, made a new group of stellar evolution, uh, including uh, master students, PhD students, and postdocs. Uh, since his stay there at the IREA, he's uh, directed, he has led the work of two postdocs. Uh, he has uh, got um, one PhD, uh, three uh, master theses, and another three uh, career uh, thesis. At the present, he's got four PhD students and two uh, 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 master students. And he recently got the uh, Cátedra Investigación para Jóvenes Científicos of the Master of the Marcos Moschisky in 2020, which provided by the uh, Physics Institute of the UNAM and Foundation Marcos Moschisky. Uh, I have to say that since he's arrived to Mexico in June 2017, he has published almost 50 papers in refereed uh, journals. Uh, his expertise uh, <clears throat> include both computational uh, astrophysics and observational astrophysics. In most of the cases, leading with uh, bubbles around evolved stars, including Voltaire, bubbles, planetary nebulae, and nova remnants. And now he's also destroying planetary systems. <laughs> Your turn, Jesus. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, I won't be able to see myself on the video, so just feel free to see my face sidewards. I will be speaking directly to the people in this, in this room. So whenever you want to stop me, please do so. Um, so I want to start saying thank you to everyone uh, who are here physically and on the Zoom session. Um, I'm really happy to be back in Granada. I always feel welcome whenever I come here. So um, uh, thank you again to everyone. So today I want to talk about uh, destroying planetary systems. Um, and first of all, I will give you a short uh, introduction of planet formation, which I guess there's plenty of people who are experts at the Institute about this uh, subject. I will go then into the solar-like uh, stars evolution, including the planetary nebula formation, and then the effects of uh, binary systems, including planets, and then we will go into the vestiges of planetary systems, which is the, the subject that we are working currently. Um, so you might know that Planet formation is uh, and their evolution is directly linked to the uh, formation of stars in, in the universe. Uh, stars uh, form in star forming regions and they are located in this uh, filamentary structures within our galaxy. For example, this is a Herschel image uh, combining the uh, Pax and Spire uh, data. Um, so stars form in this filamentary fil uh, uh, structures. So the star or planet and planet formation has been defined since a few decades ago by um, Shu Adam Silisano. So what they propose and which is the still accepted scenario for at least for solar like stars is that so the clumps in these filamentary structures, they collapse by gravity and as a result of uh, angular momentum and different other physical mechanisms, what we have is that we form a disk 
and then which fits the protostar, and then we end up with a planetary system. Um, of course, uh, observations and theory have been improving with the past decades. Uh, I just uh, there's plenty of, of observational works and theoretical works you can uh, find in the literature. I just wanted to mention that give uh, an example. This is um, the system AV Aurigae, and this is a work published in 2020. Um, this uh, Authors use uh, sphere H-band observations, which you cannot read on the top of here. Um, and this is how, how the protoplanetary disk is uh, uh, accumulating material to form what will be a planet. And this, of course, can be contrasted with uh, hydrodynamical simulations of uh, uh, gaseous, gaseous and dust-rich disks uh, around proto uh, stars. Uh, there's Plenty of currently, there's plenty of time used to uh, characterize, search, and study these uh, protoplanetary disks. Uh, this is just an example of one large project. Uh, it's called D Sharp and has been done with a NAC VLT NACO instrument in the L band. So you can see here a large morpho number of morphologies. And what we know, what we think is that planets are forming within this. Uh, spaces, these burrows between uh, the, the rings. So this is where planets are being uh, formed. Also, there's lots of uh, time invested in the characterization, the search of planets around uh, mature uh, stars. In particular, uh, we recently, NASA announced recently that we passed the 5,000 confirmed planets around um, main sequence stars. There's uh, more than 8,000 candidates and which correspond to 3,700 uh, planetary systems. This is by April 20th. And of course, in this web page, if you have ever been there, you can, uh, uh, you can take a look at the numbers, uh, which are the most the numerous uh, planets, which you can see are the giant gaseous uh, planets, Neptune-like, super Earth, gas giant, and some terrestrial and unknown planets. Uh, the larger planets are easier to detect because of uh, different conditions and, and the methods we use to detect them. I want to mention, mention uh, that the first planet, in part, actually the first uh, planetary system detected, ever detected, was around this uh, Apultra star, Apultar, which is uh, the remnants of a massive star, which allegedly exploded as a supernova. Um, it was particularly easy to detect, easy uh, coding marks, uh, because the authors, what they did is, is one expects that a pulsar has a very specific uh, time variation. So what these people did is they just subtracted different uh, periodicities from the light curve, and they, they suggested that different contributions correspond to different planets. And these correspond to one, two, three, and four uh, planets. That, that was in 1992. So, which uh, is like 30 years ago. But the first um, exoplanet around a solar like star was uh, reported in 1995. Um, so, this, um, this uh, authors, which you cannot read here, is Mayer and Quellots in 1995. So, what they, they did, they used this at the transit uh, uh, tool to detect a Jupiter like planet around this solar like, this is 1.1 solar mass star. Um, and since then, you can go into uh, the literature and find lots of lovely papers reporting the discoveries of planets. This is just the one that I like the most because they have this gift image and then you can actually see the planets moving around the star. So the star is hidden here behind this coronagraph. So you can actually hide the, bright, the brightness from the star and then you see how this, the planets move around. Like, I think this is a seven, year, seven years period of time. This, the start is HR 8799 and this, this paper is from 2008. But, um, but then we know, we are convinced that um, solar-like stars evolve and create the most beautiful objects in astronomy, which are the planetary nebulae. Uh, and this is just an example of a planetary nebula. This is uh, NGC 2022. This is this, this year's planetary nebula. 
Um, and I won't go into the details. If you want, you can ask at the end of the talk, but let me just uh, tell you. So this is the HR diagram of um, uh, one solar mass star. So we start in the main sequence phase and then the star uh, runs out of hydrogen in the nucleus. So by different factors. So the star evolves and becomes um, a symptotic giant branch star, reducing its temperature to something about 3000 uh, degrees. And then um, the gravity of the star is uh, decreased. So the mass loss rates material is lost by the star. And then we have the inner uh, post ATV uh, object, which is starts to increase in its temperature. The ionizing photon flux increases and then creates photo ionized nebulae, which are identified as planetary nebulae. Finally, the material just mixes with the ISM and then we end up with a hot white dwarf. So these are the three main uh, phases we, I want to concentrate. But of course, there's a lot of physics in, in between. Um, in particular, during the AGV phase, um, the star exhibits a very dense and slow uh, wind that creates these magnificent uh, shells. This is um, CO emission from this AGV star, which is a T until A. The size of this shell is about 0 0.05 parsec, which is 10,000 astronomical units, which is a lot compared, let's say, with our solar system. Then when we uh, have, we enter the post AGV phase, so the start uh, uh, increases its temperature. So it develops a line driven wind, which can, can, have, can be as fast as 4,000 kilometers per second with a relatively low mass loss rate. Um, the important thing here is that the ionizing photon flux can be as high as 10 to the 46 uh, photons per second or higher than that. So what you see here in this image is the, the inner rim, which is produced by the uh, fast stellar wind, and then the outer ionized nebula. This is NGC 6891 image uh, obtained from HST. And the image is the combination of oxygen three and H alpha. So all of these effects, the winds, photonization, shocks and everything, this is what creates the uh, planetary nebulae. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the nebula just expands and then mixes with the ISM and it's so far away from the start that and the density goes uh, down. So we don't see any more that any hints of, of a nebula. And then we end up with a white dwarf, a blue object, which I point in here. This is a white dwarf uh, 0005 plus 511, which I will talk about later. Um, so this is a very nice image from ESO, uh, which uh, can shows that planetary nebula has a, like a large uh, number of uh, objects which are round and not round in particular. You can see that most of them have nothing to do with spherical symmetry. Um, so these are examples of non-round planetary nebulae, which are the most dominant planetary nebulae. Um, you can see that most of them exhibit like cone-like um, symmetry. They're hourglass symmetries, bipolars, jets. So there's a, a lot of that I, the, the scenario that I just told you, this win-win interaction, was, it does, doesn't hold or it cannot explain this um, morphologies. Of course, this is something that has been known for a long time. And the problem now is that even those are very round or they seem to be round, when looked at a 10 meter telescope, you, you can start detecting these amazing uh, bipolar flows, which are very fast. This is in particular, this is the um, NGC 2359, uh, 92, um, the Lion's Head Nebula. And you can see this a very fast 200 kilometers per second jet, which is piercing through the nebula. So even though those that look round, they're actually not round when look with better uh, instrumentation. Um, so planetary nebulae shaping uh, has been discussed for years since the uh, late 80s. Um, and there has been three uh, uh, 
physical phenomena that have been proposed to explain these morphologies. First of all, has been rotation. So what people suggested is that the star has to fast rotate in order to create that the mass loss has to be bipolar. But we know that the required uh, rotation in order to start to produce these jets uh, have to be like larger than the break in velocity of the star. So this, is, this cannot be accounted for. Uh, on the other hand, binarity and magnetic fields uh, have been able to explain with uh, simulations the formation of this um, nebulae. And recently or more, um, um, one of the scenarios that has been taken lots of impetu is the common envelope evolution, which is that when, when the star enters this um, AGB phase and inflates its outer envelopes, a companion may enter um, the atmosphere of the, of the inflated star. So the, the orbital parameters, they get reduced and the gravitational energy is transferred into the, the envelope. And then this produces the bipolar mechanism. Um, there's currently lots of simulations one can find in the literature talking about describing this um, in binary interactions, which have been directly compared to ALMA observations of protoplanetary nebula. And you can tell the differences are, well, there are almost no differences in between models and observations. Um, this is just an example I found of a, a common envelope uh, simulation. What we are seeing here is the Paul Own simulation. The two stars uh, represent the position of the stars. And you can, you, you can see that the, the orbital separation was larger and then they became closer and material is being ejected in these spirals or uh, structures that when looked into the whole uh, edge on, uh, this is the orbital plane view. So you can see that this create these toroidal structures and then the jets are naturally explained because jets are produced by the uh, escape velocity from the companion. So you see this very nice, uh, structures. Again, there's plenty of simulations uh, exploring these effects and on the initial separation, the mass loss, the mass ratio between the, com the companions, the different evolutions. So it's, it's very rich phenomena. But okay, so when the star enters the AGB phase, it inflates its outer layers to more than 300 uh, solar uh, radio, which is something between one and two astronomical units. So we, we will have this. So in this particular case in our solar system, so the sun will consume something about Mars or something like that. Um, we know since a few times ago that, um, so those uh, planets located below something about one astronomical unit will be swallowed by the inflation of the star. And those that are farther away from one astronomical unit might be spiraling into the star, or they could they can have the decrease on the gravitational surf, uh, gravitational force will uh, make them to migrate to larger distances and probably survive the inflation of the star. Of course, it depends on the mass of the star, the position of the planets in this in the planetary systems, and different other parameters. Um, but then again, the planets or the planetary system can also um, be have the same effect as a stellar companion into shaping the planetary nebula. This has been uh, explored in recent papers. And um, well, the results are fascinating because lots of uh, planetary, uh, the central stars of planetary nebulae, some of them seem to be single stars, but with extreme bipolar uh, nebulae and we still, have detected any companions, but of course uh, we think it's planets also. So the final destinations of these planets, although they survive the evolution of the star, is expected uh, uh, their final destination is just photo evaporation by the strong um, uh, photoionizing flux from the white parts. Um, and this is a nice image I found online. So this is a blue white dwarf and a planet being photo evaporated by the strong flux from the star. Um, these are not new ideas, although the simulations have uh, now have the power to start resolving the physics of these systems. But um, Noam Soker, since the 90s, have been proposing lots of, or pushing this idea of the substellar companions uh, shaping or driving the shape of planetary nebulae. We still haven't 
don't have any clear uh, identification of uh, systems that have planets that sh have shaped in planetary nebulae. We still don't have any, any confirmation of this. But uh, planets have been found to be um, um, guilty of, of shaping the, the AGB mass loss uh, from some stars. These are examples detected by, with ALMA, I think, published in 2020 by the Sun. Um, so what they propose here is that these apparent single stars have these spiral-like structures around them. So they attribute this to the, to the um, orbital um, presence of, of planets. So here in colors, you see the, the blue shifted CO lines between uh, in, from the uh, systemic velocity. So you see these very nice structures and some of them, these uh, uh, velocity gradients within the, the molecular material. And regarding uh, white dwarfs. So in 2021, there's this uh, review written by Veras uh, that reported all of these structures that are present or have been detected by 2021 uh, around white dwarfs. So he reported four major planets, uh, three minor planets, 60 disks or rings, and about a thousand planetary debris disks around white dwarfs. Uh, in that review, so this is the four examples that he presents. So you can see, so this is one uh, white dwarf and a pulsar uh, uh, with a, a Jupiter-like planet, a Jupiter-like planet and a white dwarf, uh, something that, that he calls evaporating ice gas, white dwarf. And this is one of the most complex on the bottom right panel. This is a triple system with a, a giant Jupiter-like planet. So. What he, the point that the author here in this review is trying to make is that probably there's a lot of processes that, that uh, produce this planetary system, so white dwarf planet systems. In particular, this, the more complex here has been argued that, had, that went into the common envelope in order to the tri a triple system to have uh, survived. Of course, since 2021 and this year, probably there's a lot of, you cannot see here, but there's plenty of papers that I still searching for planets around white dwarfs and the new identifications of planets around white dwarfs. Okay, so this is um, what I want to talk about. And uh, this is, we called it the vestiges of planetary systems around white dwarfs. And what we do is that we use X-ray emission in order to look for these planets. And why do we do that? So let me start by saying that uh, X-ray from white dwarfs, uh, hard X-rays uh, are only attributed to the presence of a binary companion or a stellar companion. White dwarfs have uh, affected temperatures below 10 to the five um, degrees, and they have a neg negligible contribution to hard X-ray emission to energies above 0.5 kilo electron volts in the X-ray domain. So, when, whenever we see X-ray emission associated to white dwarfs, um, it is because there's a, a latex companion which produces coronal emission or um, an accretion disk that's been accreted by a close companion. And the story on the hard X-rays from white dwarfs started, uh, this is the planetary nebula called the Ring Nebula. And in 2001, Martin, Johua, and other people reported that the X-ray emission from the central star of the Helix Nebula uh, was uh, uh, exhibit a soft X-ray emission below 0.5, which uh, is the photospheric emission from the star, and then some hard X-ray emission uh, around one kilo electron volt. Since then, uh, Yohua started this uh, long-lived project uh, looking for or characterizing the hard X-ray emission from white dwarfs. Until 2010, there were three papers published looking for all the observations uh, available from Rosat, XMM and Newton, Chandra, and then they study the, the spectral properties of these um, stars. Uh, these are, uh, I'm showing here just um, a few examples uh, to start with. So you see they are all more or less different and they all have, um, 
a contribution to the hard X-ray emission from point, this is, I'm highlighting here, uh, 0.6 up to 10 electron volts. And these uh, cases, and most of them uh, so far, they are, uh, they have, companions which were identified through infrared um, observations and in some cases they have accretion disks we uh, which are identified through other mechanisms h alpha uh, emission lines for example but within this sample of hundreds or around 60 white dwarfs there were some unique cases which were uh, hot white dwarfs with uh, effective temperatures of 200,000 uh, Kelvin, 100,000 uh, Kelvins, but no signatures of a stellar companion, but still strong X-ray emission. Uh, in particular, so in 2021, we, I, is when I joined this project, which is long lived, as I mentioned, and we analyzed um, new x Newton data on these three uh, white, uh, hot white dwarfs. Uh, so this is, KPD, the one that I've shown you an image before. PG1159 is one of the most iconic hot white dwarfs in the literature. And white dwarf uh, 0121, which is very similar to PG1159. Um, the black lines and the dots are the observations that end the best uh, fit model. Um, I wanna highlight here that, that, I don't know if you can see this um, solid line at the, leftmost edge of this spectrum. This is the contribution from the star. The rest is just hard X-ray emission. So photosphere contribution is just this purple or dark blue line here. Um, in particular, this uh, KPD uh, 005 is the only one that has enough count rates or photons for us to produce a, a temporal variation, variation analysis. So what we see here is the, is the light curves extracted from the XMM-Newton data and the Chandra data in the hard uh, bands from 0.6 up to three or 0.7 to two kilo electron volts. So we actually see variation in this, um, you can, it's evident in the XMM-Newton data and the Chandra which had some instrumental problems, but still there's some hints on this variation. So the, Temporal variation analysis, um, we concluded that there's a period of 4.7 hours with a false alarm probability of 1%. So it's a real variation in the hard X-ray emission. Furthermore, and more surprising is that we also see some spectral variations. Although the spectrum, uh, we what we did is we extracted a spectrum in the lower uh, state and the higher state. So you might not see it if you're not, uh, familiarized with uh, X-ray data, but there's some uh, contribution. This is a magnesium 11 line, and this is very likely nitrogen five line. Which, so we see differences in the, the spectra with time within a single uh, white dwarf. So this is very interesting, and we still don't know how to explain this. You can ask me what I think later. Um, but then finally, what uh, we were trying to do is we're trying to looking for this companion or at least a late type uh, companion. Here in black, you see spectra, uh, near infrared spectra from this, this hot white dwarf. And in black diamonds, these are photometric measurements. So you see the observations. Uh, and then we see no bump or no infrared excess, uh, which will be attributed to a companion. So what we did here is to estimate what will be the contribution in the infrared about for different stars from M0 to M8. And we practically or virtually see no excess in the infrared. So we propose that a substellar companion might be causing this extra emission. In particular, we said uh, it could be an M95, a sequen main sequence stars, a T-type brown dwarf or a Jupiter-like planet. Uh, if we take the, the period of the variation of the hard X-ray emission and then we compute separations with using just the simple uh, Kepler laws, and we also estimate the Rochelle law of each object, we only the Jupiter-like planet can uh, fill this Rochelle law and then create this accretion disk onto the white dwarf. And actually, the, let me just move this. The planet is located uh, something about 1.2 solar radius from the white dwarf. 
and the Rochelle of radius is estimated to be 0 0.067 uh, solar radius. So it's actually uh, overflowing this um, Rochelle lobe. Um, if we um, just estimate that the, the accretion mass on this uh, white dwarf is something can be estimated something like this. Sorry, just the windows for the Zoom people. I'm just moving the Zoom windows. Um, the mass accretion of the onto the white dwarf is something about uh, 2 10 to the 14 uh, gra grams per second, which is enough for a Jupiter-like planet to survive for 10 to the 8 years, which is very good. It's very nice. And just a, remind, a reminder, um, a Jupiter mass is 2 times 10 to the 30 grams. But okay, so if planets are contributing to the hard X-ray emission uh, from this um, white dwarf, so we still um, don't know how the variability is produced. We think it's because of the orbital motion of the, the planet, but uh, are, are there also any similar cases? Or what about magnetic fields? Uh, I didn't say so, but in the fits, we required power law uh, components into the fit, which might suggest the presence of magnetic fields. So this is when um, one of my PhD students, uh, PhD thesis started and was born. So the two, there's two goals in his PhD thesis, which is um, a systematic search uh, of variability in the hard, uh, hard X-ray emission from the satellite archives and producing the first uh, radiation hydrodynamical simulation for this phenomenon. So I will describe what we have found so far. Um, so first of all, we started by correlating the Villanova University catalog of white dwarfs, which includes more than 14,000 sources with the XMM, XMM Newton catalog. This is just to start. Um, this resulted in more than 100 white dwarfs, which is a total of 7.8 megaseconds, which is uh, 2,100 hours of observations with XMM Newton. Um, however, after rejecting those that have been defined as a, a binary systems, we end up with 32 white dwarfs, which is as good. Uh, and this is about 780 hours of observations. Um, Sandino have done a very nice work, and I'm just going to show you what, some of the results that we have. Um, nine of these white dwarfs uh, have enough counts in order to study the variability from the hard X-ray bands. These are just examples. You can see that the vari variability is evident in the systems. And in general, the periods that we can uh, estimate are something about two to 15 uh, kiloseconds, which is like half an hour to four hours. One interesting um, result that we have is that, so these are the, the spectra of the nine sources. They all are different. They're, they're not similar in any, some of them might be similar like this and this to this, but the rest of them, maybe that we don't have enough counts in these cases, but some of them they do, they're intrinsically uh, different uh, spectroscopically speaking. So this is part of the results. So this is the white dwarf on the left, the number, this is the estimated period, and then just ignore the rest of it, just, um, have in mind that we propose the same three candidates, an M9 nine, uh, main sequence stars, a brown dwarf, and a Jupiter life. So we also estimated the separations with the period and then the Rochelle lobe. And then just uh, this is the main result that the Jupiter like planets are the ones filling the Rochelle lobe. This is, these are the estimates of the, on the right uh, bold face texts, is, are the estimates of the Rochelle lobe. Of, uh, radius and then the this is the the radius of the jupiter and this is the separation the estimated separation for the different binaries so in all cases they're below the uh the separation and then some cases might suggest that uh the brown dwarf is all uh, can be also um accounted for this uh, but in general this is the jupiter-like planets um interestingly we also went and look, look for the infrared emission of these uh, systems. So what we have here is the six sources that we found uh, 
a complete ses, a set of infrared data. And we have, I am plotting here the different uh, uh, black body contributions from the stars in blue. And then the rest of the mid infrared is the contribution from uh, debris disks or, or clouds. In particular for uh, this, um, the white dwarf 0121, the one in the middle, the middle top panel, we produce a specific cloudy model of this star and we need the model uh, requires a, something like an Oort cloud with a hundred to a uh, thousand astronomical units surrounding the star. So um, our conclusion in this part is that hard X-ray emission uh, is produced by accretion from a Jupiter-like planet, but we also have uh, infrared excess that suggests uh, the presence of debris disks or uh, something like an Oort cloud around the white dwarfs. So this is what we call that we are witnessing the vestiges of planetary systems. Um, we still have some work to do. In particular, we see that there's, although the spectra of the X-ray emission are different within all sources, we seem to have some correlations between the total luminosity, X-ray luminosity, and the hard X-ray emission, which still don't know if it's true or just an artifact. But in particular, we see that if we compare the variation of the, the period and the luminosities, these two sources, at, which are the less X-ray luminous, are those that are the cooler ones. These are two stars with 8,000 degrees um, of affected temperature. So this might be telling us something on this, but we still require more objects in order to increase our statistics. And we still need to check this correlation. But these are um, very nice, surprising results. We're still working on it. Finally, um, so the second part of this uh, project is to develop radiation, I don't know, gravel radiation hydrodynamical simulations um, where we account for the presence of a white dwarf, hot white dwarfs, and the presence of a uh, Jupiter-like planet. So we, as we est we can estimate the mass loss rate or the accretion mass onto the white dwarf, we can use those as parameters. We know the, the masses of the objects, the orbital uh, period, mass uh, accretion rate. So we have all of the ingredients in order to produce our own simulations and explore the physics behind these um, systems. So I am gonna show you to the results of density, temperature, uh, soft X-ray emission, hard X-ray emission, and this is the ball on simulation of uh, four parameters close to the KPD system. And you will see on the density panel, there's a zero on the top right uh, hand of the panel. Numbers indicate hours in the simulation. So I will play it and I can replay it back again if you have any questions. So we see um, mass is, uh, mass is lost from the giant planet, and then it is gravitationally attracted into the white dwarf, into this spiral um, density enhancements. And then you can see that X-ray emission is uh, present in a, something like a disc-like structure that seems to be well contained. The temperature only have the highest temperature, which is the X-ray emitting is very close to the star. And then this is the edge on of the, you can more or less see here the planet and this, this is the white dwarf, this is the planet and the white dwarf is here. So we, this is the edge on, so there's a formation of a disc um, and the hottest is the, the region close to the star, which is the temperature is increased because of viscosity, viscosity effects. Um, this is something that we're still working on. We, we need to run different uh, simulations for different um, uh, parameters, let's say masses or periods, variability periods. But these are promising. These are very promising. And okay, so I'll, I'm gonna leave you with my final comments. Um, planets can definitely survive the harsh evolution of uh, produced by the hot stars. Um, the final destination will be to be photo evaporated uh, from the, uh, the hot, around the hot white dwarfs. And this, my second point here is a very interesting uh, uh, scenario that I've been, Camila has been uh, talking lately and we, I haven't got the chance to talk much with her, but which I will be very interesting, is 
can a second generation of planets form during the common envelope phase, which is will be uh, another explanation why we still have planets after this dramatic evolution and dramatic changes in the stellar wind parameters. Um, Planets can produce the same effects as white dwarf stellar companions. Uh, they, they can help shaping the mass laws and they also produce hard X-ray emission and they likely to, to pollute the white dwarf surface. So there's um, a lot of uh, examples in the literature uh, of people reporting that white dwarf with very unique uh, uh, abundances, which most of the times are attributed to the uh, engulfing of a planet, for example. Um, so what we can, can conclude from the, the analysis of the hard X-ray emission is that um, this, the combination of the, the presence of the hard X-ray emission and this infrared excess is what we see as the, the last vestiges of planetary systems around these white dwarfs. Um, we are yet to understand the configuration of such systems because if you remember the planet is very close to the star, but then we have a larger structure farther away. So maybe there's migration between planets. This could be something that we have not explored this far. We need a longer exposure time in order to start having this light, uh, nicer signal to noise um, um, light curves uh, around these white dwarfs. So this is something that we have been done proposing for more, more observations. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesus, for this wonderful talk. Very nice. And OK, for the participants uh, in Zoom, you can raise your hand for doing questions. And Jesus, if you see any question in the room, please go ahead. Uh, we have a question here in the Okay, uh -huh. go on. So, yeah, exactly. Just wait. Can you hear me? Yeah, well, I Actually, I had several questions and just a comment. One of uh, my first question is regarding the spectral energy distributions. It would be great to uh, distinguish between the uh, envelope and scenario against the DC scenario. I am wondering if you can put again the slides. I am wondering how do you infer the size of these infrared sets, uh, the size of the uh, structures of about 200 AU and 2000 AU to say or to claim this is a this, how you infer it? Because I am worried because it could be a this, but also it could be an envelope, the ejected envelope. This is a key point to, to claim this is a disk. Yeah, yeah. actually, uh, that's why I wrote the debris disks or, or clouds. Uh, some models require the structure to be spherical, like a, um, a shell. And in other cases, it could be a very broad uh, disk. Uh, but uh, we haven't done it uh, very carefully. We just did it in order to try to get a fit to the infrared data. But this is something that is, is, is not being done properly. And it also depends on the, how big the, the structures are, the dust, the, the composition of the dust. And so it, it, it requires more modeling in the, into that sense. But we were only uh, trying to fit the size of the structure. We were not uh, worried in particular in this uh, paper, we're not worried on the chemistry on this, uh, but this is something that we can be explored definitely in the future. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mayra, can you approach to Jesus? <laughs> not necessary to change the micro, just-, just Or she can ask and I can repeat the question also. Okay, yeah, this- uh -huh. uh? Que te lo acerques así. No, how do you constrain the size ah. of this structure to explain the infrared sectors? I guess this is very important yes. to play if this is a disk or a envelope. Of course not. So in cloudy, part of the, the parameters that you include in the model and, the, and you can vary is the the ionizing photon flux from the start, which is or a black body model radiation, whatever. 
And then you start defining, uh, we started by, uh, as I told you, uh, shell. And then we started by varying the inner and the outer shell. And this is what uh, uh, lets you know a, a little bit about uh, the contribution from the two shells. So as I mentioned, we just did very rough simulations. Cloudy works in, in 1D. It's, uh, it's very um, swift when for the calculations. So we just vary the inner and the outer radius. And then once you fix the inner radius, which lets you know about the, the inner part of the disk is this part, the hottest part. And then as you can tell, but no, in not in all cases, we have longer wavelength uh, measurements. Actually, in particular, this is the Helix Nebula, the one in the bottom right. And we were thinking on ALMA data for this, but there's currently ALMA data and they do not detect the structure so this is so we don't know what's happening here <laughs> okay <laughs> anybody else here there we have we have a question on the chat okay i can read it does the the question is by mike kremlo does the model of the in infrared access the breeze disk or or cloud also provide the mass estimates of this assumed structure. Uh, for this, you also start, uh, you have, we have to start thinking on um, filling factors and the real geometry, which we have not done. This was just a swift back of the envelope calculation. So we, the answer is we haven't estimated any masses for the, this debris disk or, or clouds. Mm -hmm. We have a question, Manuel, please, go on. Uh, hello, Jesus and everybody else. Um, thank you very much for your talk, very illuminating. And yeah, going through all the different stadium of the evolution. I have one question about, we are recently looking at the mass loss rate of the hot Jupiters around the star, namely K star, using the helium triplet line in the near infrared. Um, they have re this has been really very recent, only a couple of years ago. Uh, have you considered, or anybody have been, whether it is vis vis feasible to get any, uh, to measure the helium triplet line of those systems? We haven't thought about it. We just, we've been using the X-ray as signature of the presence of these uh, Jupiter-like planets. But we haven't thought about any other kind of observations so far, because, Although I mentioned that there were only uh, nine of these sources, my student analyzed the more than a hundred white dwarf observations. So he's, he took his time and we also go in for the Chandra uh, archive. So this is currently not part of our plan, but of course it will be nice to detect the signatures of the planet in other uh, wavelengths. Yeah, you can uh, yeah, well, of course. Uh, for example, the central star of the Helix Nebula uh, exhibits a variation of the H alpha line, and uh, some other central stars of the of planetary nebula also exhibit variation of the H alpha line, which I guess is by irradiation probably. And uh, but in those cases, there's no a signature of a companion, so very likely uh, is due to the presence of planets. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think it is well at least from the point of excitation, we had the ingredient enough because we had the strong X-ray, which will be excited the the helium triple line. The one is in an excited state. So I think it could be uh, useful try to just a little up to uh, back on the envelope calculation about that kind of helium triple observation could be done. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, we have a question here. Okay, go. Um, about the variability. Um, so 
I'm just thinking of uh, the geometry of the system. So basically there is a planet that is like uh, evaporating and then you have uh, this tail that is uh, um, the, the tail of the atmosphere of the planet that is basically um, creating on the star. So is this variability due to the thickness of the atmosphere that is evaporating or to what specifically that we can think? We haven't explored this, but um, it, it might be what, what we think from these simulations, it might be attributed to different factors. For example, um, here the disk is you cannot see is not homogeneous or at least we haven't arrived to any cell similar uh, result. Uh, it can also be to, due to cells absorption from the disk. These are only cuts in the plane. So we still need to include the inclination. So maybe these structures are, are spiraling. Let me just try to. Might be the ones producing the variability. We, we still need to do this um, synthetic images of this, this. These are just the hydrodynamical results. And this is only a cut in the edge on or the pole on plane. This is something we still need to do. Initially, what we think is causing the variability is due to the orbit of the planet. But the simulations are showing that the, the disk is not homogeneous, not too far in the simulation. These simulations are still running in the uh, cluster in, in UNAM. I had a question uh, regarding these simulations. It seemed to me the temperature in the this mid plane high, 10 to the five, 10 to the seven. I, I wondered, is the, are you representing the gas or the dust emission? Because the dust is destroyed, the sublimation temperature is around one or 2,000 AU, but uh, it seemed to me that this temperature of the simulation are so high, no? Uh, They're actually high because there's X-rays. Otherwise, we wouldn't have X-rays. Uh, X-rays are detected for a gas around above 10 to the 6. If there will be any, you can see here, the highest temperature correspond to the highest X-ray emissivity. If there's no high dust, we don't have X-ray emission. There's no dust in the simulation, in the simulation. Um, yeah. It's just gas, yes. So this, the shock is produced in the disk. So due to viscosity effect and the accretion, uh, the gas it gets heat up to temperatures higher to, than to the six. Um, and otherwise we wouldn't have any X-ray emission. The X-ray emission is detected above uh, 5.5, 5, 10 to the five Kelvin. Mm -hmm. There's no dust in the simulation. No, in order to include dust, you need to, to use a double uh, I don't know, a double scheme solver because gas and dust might not be coupled to the radiation. No. Then again, what I said before is that the, the disk is very small compared to the size of the this uh, dusty rich structures. The disk is almost very close to the to the white dwarf, and the, this uh, infrared emission that we detect, they have like they're far farther away, so they're not resolving the simulations. That's why it's not included here. We have a question here. Okay, Eva, please go on. Hi, Jesus. Hola. Nice talk. Hola. <laughs> very nice talk. Uh, my question is regarding the compatibility of, I mean, this high rate of detections of uh, planetary systems. Let's, let's assume that there are detections, right? That you have uh, uh, six uh, planetary systems around a planetary nebula. If you compare with the rate of detections around white dwarfs, uh, uh, then this rate is very high. I mean, in order to get the planet close to a, to a white dwarf, to explain uh, pollution, to explain the, the presence of the disks uh, or the Keplerian velocities of the disks that you get in the white dwarfs, then you have to, to assume that, uh, that, for example, the, the, the scenario that works uh, better 
is if you assume that you have multiple systems and they get uh, destabilized uh, when the heavy mass loss takes place. But this mechanism takes time. It will not happen in the short time of the planetary nebula phase. And before that, you have the AGB phase, which is going to basically shallow every planetary system that you are going to have near mm -hmm. by. So my question is, uh, how compatible is this high rate of detections or putative detections with what you get in the white dwarfs? Actually, these are detections in white dwarfs. The, these are not central stars of planetary nebula. With these temperatures? I mean, they are very hot. They are. These are white dwarfs, yes. Uh, white dwarfs with very, Yeah, very well, the high... central stars of planetary nebula are white dwarfs. But I mean, my point is that they are very hot. They are very early in evolution. And for the mechanism of instability to take place, you need time. Okay, uh, yeah, well, uh, the, the Helix Nebula, which is, so the, in this image that I'm showing, the only uh, white dwarf that is uh, a central star of a planetary nebula is the one on the right bottom panel, which is the Helix Nebula. Um, so far, people don't understand why the properties or the X-ray emission, we propose that is very close or similar to other white dwarfs that do not have planetary nebula associated. And it has very similar uh, X-ray properties, which we explain with the presence of a planet. Um, I don't know nothing about the, uh, on the time scales that a planet should survive, but at least these are the best candidates to explain the X-ray emission. Um, I de definitely ignored uh, anything you mentioned, <laughs> but uh, we, what we see is that we have this excess. We don't have any companion, any stellar companion. So at least a substellar object should be producing um, the, this excess. Either most likely it's a Jupiter-like planet and it could be also, oh, sorry, a uh, brown dwarf. Yeah, sorry for not having the answer. Okay. You see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now my point is that it has to be consistent with uh, with all the body of observations and simulations that uh, we have been doing on on white dwarfs and evolution of planetary systems. So I mean, this is very exciting. I mean, if if it is true that it is really a, a planetary companion, it's very exciting. But but, uh, but then you need to explain uh, how how is uh, is there and how it gets there yeah. and uh, and the mechanism that operate i mean for example in instabilities on the white dwarf they operate uh, later i mean they need more time than the ones uh, that you have i mean at least with effective temperatures that you have there yes that would uh -huh. be a problem for that all of those is effects for example migration i, I have no idea on how it it it, it, it no, no, comes no, to no. occur for example let's say how can you have this very massive gaseous planets very close to the star and then this debris disk further away? Uh, I do not understand or, or not, uh, not trying to understand the current configuration. This is just the evidence on the x-rays and the infrared mm -hmm. that we have, but we haven't done any further uh, uh, investigation into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eva. More questions for Jesus? We don't have any questions here. People are afraid of me. Okay, in none, we can uh, end this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, just uh, one more question. How long you will be in Granada, Jesus? I will be here until the 31st of, of May. So still one month, a little bit more than one month. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you.